welcome to St. Stephen United Methodist Church. I'm Kelly Slayball, the Director of Adult Small Group Ministries. And on behalf of the entire staff here at St. Stephen, we just wanna welcome you to worship this morning. Whether you are watching in the Charlotte area or in another state, you are a part of the St. Stephen family and we are glad that you're here. And we wanna know that you're here. So if you would, please just leave us a comment in the comments section on Facebook, if that is how you're watching us today. Uh, if you're watching on our website, you can click a button that says register your presence. Or feel free to drop us an email. We would love to hear from you, especially if you are a guest today. We wanna to welcome you, answer any questions you have, uh, and just connect you into the life of the church. Now this morning, we are wrapping up our sermon series called Frequently Asked Questions. And in this series, we've been taking a look at, at questions that we all may have had about faith at one time or another that maybe we don't typically talk about in church. These last few weeks, we've looked at, at what heaven is and what hell is and how we are to live on this earth in the here and the now. This morning, Ken is gonna be talking about this book, the Bible, the best-selling book of all time. And yet, how did we get this book? Is it reliable? How do we even read it? It seems very different from any other book that we've read before. Our hope and our prayer is that after this time together today, you will walk away with new insights, refreshed and renewed in your spirit and reminded once again, of God's immense love for you. Our God is alive and well. Let us worship God this day. Good morning. As we begin, we join in a statement of faith of the United Church of Canada. Reading together, we are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus, crucified and risen, our judge and our hope in life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. The tune of our opening hymn this morning is from centuries back in the classical period of music history, Austria's Franz Josef Haydn. The words are much more contemporary, however, and they speak of the influence of Holy Scripture in the life of Christendom for 2,000 years. Word of God across the ages. Let's join in singing.
Good morning. As we gather now for our time of prayer, please be sure and pay attention to the names on your screen now and continue sending your prayer requests in to the main office. Kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for waking us up, for rousing us from our slumber and gathering us together though apart in your name. God, you know all and you care for all things. Help us to understand what that looks like in practice. Help us to recognize your love, not just in those we surround ourselves with every day, but for all those who live, God. In a world that seems so easily tempted to badness, Father, call us to goodness, call us to you. As we, as a nation, as a country, as a people, as a world, come out of a time of, of pandemic and sickness, don't just let us return to normal, oh God, but call us to something new. Call us to a new way to embrace community, a new way to embrace others. Help us to build a community that reflects your love, your joy. Keep reminding us, oh God, that you are in control and that it's at your direction that we do all things. Call us deeper into relationship with you so that we might be called deeper into relationship with others. And hear us, O oh God, now as we pray the prayer your son Jesus taught us while he was here on earth, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So today we come and we have the uh, honor and the privilege to celebrate the sacrament of baptism. And the sacrament of baptism is one of two in the United Methodist Church that we recognize, uh, Holy Communion being the other and baptism being the second one. So baptism is an outward invisible sign that affirms something that's in, within each one of us. That, and that is God's love and God's grace that is present in our lives before we even recognize it ourselves. And so uh, today, Amelia Dungan comes to be baptized. Her mom and her dad, uh, Ben and Jillian and, and grandparents back here, family and friends who have gathered with us. Well, we, we come together to, to celebrate this and to uh, affirm this. And so it's a joy to invite mom, dad, and Amelia to come and join me here. Join me right here. And so part of it, you have a part to play with as family and friends and the whole church congregation does as well. But let me ask you as mom and dad uh, these questions. Do you confess Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in His grace and promise to serve Him as your Lord, if so, say, I will. Will you continue to seek to be a follower of Jesus and strive, as we say here at St. Stephen, to be the hands and the feet and the heart of Jesus? And will you nurture Amelia in Christ's holy church that by your teaching and example she may be guided to accept God's grace for herself, to profess her faith openly, and to lead a Christian life? Well, you as family and friends and as our congregation, wherever you might be on this day, as I've said before, you have a part to play in this. And so I ask you, and you'll find your response on the screen, uh, do you, as the body, the church, will you nurture one another in Christian faith and life and include Amelia now before you in your care? If so, will you join me? With God's help, we will proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. We will surround this person with a community of love and forgiveness that she may grow in her service to others. We will pray for her 
that she may be a true disciple who walks in the way that leads to life. Water signifies signifies life. It signifies also death. It's the life that God gives us. But it is the new life, the dying of self, and the, the new life that we find in Him when we place our faith and our trust in Him as well. And so let us pray together. Lord, we ask that you pour out your Holy Spirit and to bless this gift of water and she who receives it this day, to wash away her sin and clothe her in righteousness throughout her life, that by dying and being raised with Christ, she may share in his final victory. been a while since I've had one your size. Oh, mine are grown much older. So it's Amelia Lane, correct? Alright. So Amelia Lane. There you go. Amelia Lane Duncan. I baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. May that Spirit work within you so that as you grow, you may be strong and faithful woman for Christ. Amen. Amen. All right, wait. St. Stephen, folks, you may recognize Ben. He was probably a lot younger last time you were around here, right? Maybe a little smaller? Yeah, yeah. maybe a little more hair. Maybe a little more hair, but if you don't know, uh, Ben is the son of Patty and Dan Duncan here at St. Stephen. Jillian is their daughter and law. So if you see Patty or Dan or, yeah, you know, Ben, Jillian, make sure that you send them a congratulations as well and add them uh, to, your, uh, to your prayers. Well, we celebrate this day with you in this milestone and lovely Miss Amelia. Go in peace. Amen. Good morning, kiddos, and welcome to worship. I want to talk to you today about my favorite book of all time by far. My favorite book is definitely the Bible. As you can see, I have quite the collection. I have a lot of children's Bibles, but this is only a portion of the ones that I have. And then I have paraphrases and different translations of the Bible. And one of the reasons that I love the Bible so much is that no matter what I'm feeling or struggling with, whether it's loneliness, relationships, issues of justice and fairness, forgiveness, pride, envy, self-doubt, self-control, disappointment, loss, or fear. I can find stories of people who've gone before me in the Bible who struggled with the exact same things. And I can learn from their stories and their experiences. And I can also see how the God who created us and loves us was with them, cared for them, loved them, and provided just what they needed. And this gives me hope. It strengthens my hope in God and humanity. And it reminds me that I am not alone, that we can do hard things with the help of God and one another. You see, the Bible to me is less a book of an answer answer book than it is an invitation to wrestle with and ask questions so that we can find meanings for our own life today. The Bible teaches us how to live together as peacemakers and it teaches us how to love one another as Jesus loved us. Two of my favorite children's Bibles that I read most often and sometimes that I read um, over one of the other paraphrases or translations is Shine On and Growing in God's Love. The reason that these are my favorite is because they use inclusive language for God so as not to limit our vision or understanding of who God is, but expands the mystery of God as God as healer, friend, teacher, shepherd, mother, caregiver, peacemaker, father, and much, much more. I love the illustrations in these Bibles. I'll show you a couple. I love these. They 
really capture the feeling and the sense of what was going on in these stories. There's another one from this one. They're just, they're, they're beautiful. And I love in this Bible in particular that each story ends with three questions. Hear, see, and act. And these questions invite the reader to engage the story with their imagination and creativity and to search for meaning for your own life. This week, I hope that you will spend time with your family reading the Bible, whatever Bible that you have, a children's Bible, a paraphrase, a translation, and that you will ask questions and that you will search for the meaning for your own life. Will you pray with me? Thank you, God, for the gift of your holy word. Thank you for the ways that it teaches us, encourages us, and gives us hope and deepens our relationship with you. Amen. This morning's scripture passage comes to us from Paul's second letter to his colleague Timothy. Paul writes these words. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that everyone of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, these last few weeks, we've been in a series entitled Frequently Asked Questions, whereby we've been looking at questions that maybe you've had um, and maybe the church hasn't always talked a lot about. And so we've talked about things like heaven and hell and earth. And, and it's interesting, all of those things and, what, and how we can talk about them and what we know about all those things really comes down to this book, you know, the, the Bible. I mean, this is the foundation of our faith. It is the primary way in which we know who God is, who we are, yeah, and, and how we are to relate to God and, and, and to one another. This is the, the foundation. And so I want us to talk about this book a little bit today. And it's a complicated book, right? You know, it's a book that isn't always easy to understand, correct, right? I mean, this is a book I believe that we continually have to wrestle with and, and continually have to read and continually have to, to study. I mean, we call it the living word of God. Why? Because I think it continually speaks to us and has for thousands of years. And the danger is when we don't wrestle with it and we don't read it and we don't study it, then our view of it and how we understand it can be overly simplistic our theology of Scripture never really grows from maybe when we were just kids. Uh, some of you may remember this, this little children's song. Uh, you know, uh, the B-I-B-L-E, now that's the book for me. I stand upon the Word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. Well, unfortunately for some, that's as, as far as their understanding uh, of the Bible has actually gone. You know, the God said it, I believe it. That settles it. And I wish it was that easy. But when you really begin to dig into this book, what you quickly find is that it is much more complicated than that. Now, there was a Gallup poll uh, that was done uh, several years ago, I think back in 2017, that, that basically asked the question, you know, how do you read the scriptures or do you take the scriptures, the Bible, literally? And 25% uh, in, the, in the poll said, yeah, I do. I mean, I, you know, I, when I read it, I take every, everything absolutely literally, which means also 75% of Americans, was, was asking of Americans, you know, they think something else. That maybe this is just the, you know, this is the inspired word of God. Uh, some parts to be taken literally, some not so much. Others would say, well, it's just a collection of fairy tales and, and some ancient history. Others, you know, thanks to people like Dan Brown, you know, believe the Bible was put together by a, a secret committee, you know, to hide the real truth about who Jesus uh, is. You know. So there's all kinds of ways people look at this book and understand this book and interpret this book. You know, as United Methodist, this is what we, uh, some of what we officially say about the Bible. Uh, we believe the Bible was inspired by God and contains all things necessary for salvation. 
When read under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the Bible is our true rule and guide for faith and practice. And that comes from our articles of religion and some other places. Uh, but there are, there's various views and understandings of the Bible. And I'm sure that is uh, the case this morning. You probably have maybe a different view, a different understanding. You, you read it differently, you approach it differently. I, I, there's a diversity in that. Uh, and so what I want us to do, though, is just to kind of, for you, wherever you might fall on that spectrum, just to kind of think about that. And, and, and again, how do you approach the scriptures? And so I wanna go, I'm going to do three things this morning. I'm going to do a, just a, a kind of brief history of the Bible. Uh, uh, how was it put together? Why we can trust it and how reliable it is? And, and then also a little bit about how we can approach these scriptures. So that's what I want us to do. So let's start with, you know, well, what is the Bible? If someone asks you the question, hey, what's the Bible? What would you tell them? Easy answer, quick answer is, well, it's God's Word. That's great. So expound upon that. <laughs> that's when it becomes a little more difficult, uh, doesn't it? Uh, so, you know, I, actually, I, I found a little video that maybe will, will help us answer this question. It actually uh, takes this question and answers it in three different ways. So um, take a look. So what is the Bible? Well, on the one hand, it's the best-selling book of all time. It's been translated into over 1,200 languages. Uh, we can say that it's a book uh, that contains 875 pages, depending upon the translation, uh, and 375 milliliters of, uh, uh, of, of ink. Uh, so for some, they say, well, that's what it is. It's just ink on a page. Others may say, well, it's a collection of 66 different, 66 different documents written over a period of, what, 1,400 years. And so maybe it's not just a book, it's really a library. It's a collection of documents written over a long period of time. Uh, you know, the word Bible itself actually means the book, right? It means book. And so we call it the Bible, the book, the book. But even though it's a collection of documents, even though it's been written over a period of 1,400 years, I believe it's still one story. You know, one story that sweeps over history and, and through time that changes the world. Yeah, it's, it's ink and it's pages, uh, but it's more than that. Yeah, it's a collection of, of writings, but again, it's more than that. It's a story that gives us life. It's God speaking to us His truth. God speaking His truth to us in human words. As we heard just a, you know, a moment ago, you know, Paul said it this way in his second letter to Timothy. You know, he said, all scripture is God-breathed, useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that everyone of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Well, and you've probably maybe heard this word. Uh, you know, the, the Greek word used here in 2 Timothy that Paul uses is, that means God-breathed is this word theotnistus. Theotnistas. Not easy to say either. <laughs> okay, but theotnistas. And it means God breathe. But what's interesting about this word is that this is the only place we find the use of this word. In the first century, we don't find it in any other document, religious or not. And so it's kind of like this word that maybe Paul made up himself, that he coined himself to help us better understand uh, the, the scriptures to express something that, that he wanted people to that, that God breathed upon the scriptures. The Theognistus. God breathed upon and through the scriptures so they speak to us. Now, the thing is, Paul didn't say, well, this is how that happened. Paul just said that it happened. And so, over the centuries, you know, churches have developed all kinds of elaborate ways to, uh, 
to, to understand this or to explain it. And so some say, well, it's inerrant, it's infallible, it's a verbal plenary inspiration. Uh, you know, all these, again, these terms just describe different ways in which we speak about the Bible and how we approach it and how we uh, understand how it functions as the Word of God. And unfortunately, some churches say, well, if you don't uh, understand it in this specific way, then you're not Christian. And, and, and that's unfortunate. I mean, we've divided over this issue. And it's all based on, you know, this passage, maybe a few others, uh, because no one's ever found uh, that word used in any other way. And so we're still trying to figure out exactly what that word means. What does it mean to be God-breathed, to be God, that God's word is God-inspired? You know, Paul says all scripture. Well, he's, yeah, when Paul's writing this, he's not talking about the New Testament because he's writing much of that himself. He just didn't know it at the time. And so when he says all scriptures, he's really speaking to the Old Testament, to the Hebrew Bible, the Hebrew text. When he says all scripture. So, yeah. But what is he saying, though? He's saying really all scripture, the scriptures that he knew and what we have now is a New Testament, that it is God speaking to us. God speaking to us through these words. The Bible. And so these words are both human and they are divine because it was humans who wrote them, but it was God who inspired them. And so we see both in the text, don't we? Both the human and the divine. Norman Geisler, a Christian apologist and a philosopher, he kind of explained it like this. I like this. He says, The human writer is seen as one who has received a revelation and actively participates in its writing, while God gives the revelation and oversees the writing. Hence, the message is holy from God, but the humanity of the writer is included to enhance the message. Both the divine and human concur in the same words. I like that. Paul, in another letter, this to the Corinthians, said that this is what we speak, not in words taught to us by human wisdom, but in words taught to us by the Spirit, expressing spiritual truth in spiritual words. And so I don't believe inspiration is this, uh, you know, mechanical dictation where the human element of writing is totally obliterated, okay? Uh, I think the Psalms, I think, are a great example of this. You know, when the psalmist cries out, how long, O God, will you forget me forever? You know, it, it, did God dictate those words or are we seeing the psalmist? You know, the, the humanity there. Here's the psalmist who feels like, you know, God is not there. And so they're crying out in pain. Where are you, God? You know, uh, you know I think in the scriptures we see not only the divine again, but also the humanity. And I think that's why it speaks to us so much. You know, how did we get this book? It's another always great question. Uh, you know, contrary to popular belief, Moses did not come down from Mount Sinai with the King James Version of the Bible in his hand, okay? That's not how it happened, okay? Over time, people, they compiled it. They preserved it. Over the course of thousands of years, scriptures, you know, they were compiled, they were preserved. And over that time, they became authoritative. Okay? Over time, they became authoritative. Because I want us to be real clear uh, that the church did not create the Bible. The church simply recognized that which was already authoritative, that which was already scripture. Now, the process was called canonization. Canon means rule or standard, okay? And it, so they were just recognizing the, the rule or the, the standard. So uh, how were they accepted and, and who accepted them? Well, the books, again, through this process. First, it was the Jewish rabbis and then scholars of the Old Testament. Um, later on, with the New Testament, by the early Christians and the, the early church leaders, and really, when it comes to the New Testament, uh, the church kind of based it upon a couple questions. One, hey, hey, was this document, was this gospel, was this book written by uh, one of Jesus' apostles, one of his disciples, or someone closely associated with them? So that was always one of the questions that was asked. And then the other question was, well, what's the date of the writing? How close to Jesus' life were these written, you know? The books that weren't writ- written by apostles or those that closely, closely associated with them, uh, those that weren't written within 30 or 70 years of Jesus' life, well, those were religious, but they were not on the same level as those that were canonized. 
And this is important for us to understand because there are other writings out there. You know, you've probably heard of things like the Gospel of Philip, the Gospel of uh, Judas, the, the Gospel of Mary. It seems like every few years uh, there's some new discovery of some lost book of the Bible and how the church must have suppressed it and stuff like that. But here's the thing, in all of those cases and with all of these other writings, they always were dated, they've always been dated 150 years or more after Jesus' life. And so they're much later than our Gospels. And so contrary, to, again, to Dan Brown and all the conspiracy theorists out there, the church did not create the Bible. They only recognized that which was already Scripture. The church didn't assign authority to the books of the Bible. Instead, the books over time became authoritative. They became canon because they had that authority. In his book, God Has Spoken, J.L. Parker, uh, J.L. Packer uh, wrote this. He said, The church no more gave us the New Testament canon than Sir Isaac Newton gave us the force of gravity. God gave us gravity by his work of creation. And similarly, he gave the New Testament canon by inspiring the individual books that make it up. I think that's how we got it. And I think we can, you know, is, well, then is it reliable is always a question. Can we trust it? You know, hasn't, hasn't it been corrupted through the years? Haven't, haven't we lost something uh, in translation through the years? I mean, the Bible was written thousands of years ago. Surely it's got, it must have changed, right? I mean, we've all played the game gossip. You know, you, you whisper uh, in your neighbor's ear, uh, you know, a sentence or a statement, and they whisper it and on and down the line, and when he gets to the end of it, it's never like what it originally began, is it? It's always changed. And so certainly that must have happened with the scriptures. That must have happened uh, with the Bible. Well, up until almost, to about 70, you know, up to almost 75 years, the oldest, uh, for the oldest known manuscripts that we had of any of the Bible was, uh, the Hebrew Bible were called what, the Masoret, Masoretic text, okay? And, and these manuscripts that we had, they only dated back to the ninth century. So the Masoretic text of the Hebrew Bible, Bible um, that we have physically only dated back to the ninth century. That is until we discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls. So the Masoretic texts really weren't that old. But then in 1947, you know, in the caves there in Quran, uh, the scrolls were discovered. And what was discovered, and some of you may have seen them. I remember when they, they toured through Charlotte here, and I went to, to see these uh, Dead Sea Scrolls or these fragments. And it was awesome and amazing because what they found there were these scrolls that dated back to the second century B.C. Okay? So all of a sudden, the oldest known manuscripts of the, of the Bible, of the Hebrew Bible, went back a thousand years from the Masoretic text to the second century, so 2,000 years before Christ. And in the Dead Sea Scrolls, they found uh, fragments of every book except Esther that we have in our Old Testament. And the entire book of Isaiah. It's pretty cool. And so what they did is uh, they took uh, the Dead Sea Scroll, uh, Isaiah, book of Isaiah there, and they compared it to our translation that we have today. And what they found was 95% of it was word for word. Only 5% was there any variation. And the variations, the variations were, consisted chiefly of obvious slips of the pen and variations in spelling. And so, in other words, very little, if anything, was lost in translation. Which, again, tells me that this is reliable. Hasn't been corrupted, hasn't been changed. Uh, it is reliable. We can trust it. It is God breathed. So, what does that mean then for us? For me, it reminds is a reminder of who we are, whose we are, and that we are God. You know, it is God speaking to us, the Creator, the Author of life, sharing with us. Hey, this is what life really is all about. And what Jesus said, hey, I came to give you life and delight and, and life more abundantly. And so it's God saying, you know, I want to know you more intimately. I want you to know me more intimately. You know, I, I don't want us just to believe in God. Yeah. But for these words to impact how we live, how we relate to one another. And one of the key ways to do that is to, you know, to kind of get into this. 
And so I want to just kind of briefly touch on just kind of four approaches, you know, questions to ask when we read these words. And then the first one's really easy. It's just, hey, what does it actually say? What does it actually say? Because sometimes I think we can get so focused on trying to find the, you know, the secret meaning in the text or whatever that we miss exactly, you know, exactly what it's saying or what it's actually uh, saying. You know, sometimes we just overanalyze things. And so we begin just by reading it. What is it actually saying? I mean, the Bible is a collection of books, and so as we read it, what we find is there's different genres and, uh, yeah, and different literary styles. I mean, there, there's stories like you tell around the campfire. There's poetry. You know, there's the Psalms, the Song of Solomon. There's history, First and Second Chronicles, and, and the Kings and Samuel. Uh, there's letters, you know, Romans and Thessalonians and, and Hebrews and Ephesians. There's the laws like Leviticus and, and Numbers, and so all of that helps us understand what it's saying. Knowing what genre, what literary style you're reading, again, helps you understand it. So you know, what does it actually say? But then we take it a step forward. Okay, so this is what it says. What does that mean, though? And I always encourage you to, to understand the context, the backstory, because that helps us better understand what it means. Uh, you know, what's the original context? Because some parts of the scripture were written from one person to another person. Other parts were, you know, it was written to a whole group uh, of people. Maybe they were going through a specific situation that the writer was addressing, like Paul in his letter to the Corinthians uh, there. You know, they were going through specific stuff. And so Paul's speaking uh, in, into that. Uh, you know, what was going on in Israel or in Judah when Isaiah was, was writing? You know, who was Matthew writing his gospel to? Well, who was his audience? Because all of those things, I think, help us, you know, understand what it means. We dig into that. And when we get to there, then it's like, okay, so how does it speak to us? What's the, what's the timeless principle that, that this text is teaching us, in other words? I mean, it's the living word. God's, God speaks to us through uh, God's word, you know, speaks to us in the here and now, even though it was written a thousand years ago. So, so what is that? You know, and asking that question, it, sometimes, you know, that's very clear. Text says, don't commit adultery. Pretty clear, isn't it? I don't think you don't have to overanalyze that one, do you? You know, that's pretty clear that spans all, you know, all generations. Uh, don't gossip, gossip, you know, uh, love one another. Okay, well, maybe that's not quite as clear because we have this tendency to want to say, well, I love you because, hey, you share my political views. You share my religious views. So I love you. Well, you don't. So mm, I'm sorry. I don't love you. <laughs> Or at least I don't love you as much. And so you know, we struggle with that one, don't we? What that means. And so you know, there's all, what does it mean? You know, sometimes you know, the text there's, says, I greet one another with a holy kiss. What does that mean? I mean, seriously. Does that mean I'm supposed to come up to you and give you this big, wet, sloppy kiss? Or is there something else there, you know? Uh, you know? Uh, so it's not always easy to understand. It's not always clear. Uh, we need kind of this point of reference to know the culture, the context behind statements, especially like that. Uh, so w what is this stuff teaching us? You know, welcome one another. Be compassionate. Care for the least, the last, the lost. Those, you know, living these kind of things out in, in our lives. John Wesley, he was the founder of Methodism. It was said that he was a man of one book, meaning uh, the Bible. But he also understood that, you know, the, this Bible is very complex. It's not easy to understand. And so we need to, to, to uh, use our experience, our personal experiences, our life experiences, uh, the experience of the Holy Spirit when we read these words. We need to bring our mind to it, you know, our reason to it. And we also, the, the tradition of the church helps us understand all of these things, Wesley said, helps us understand what the Bible is teaching us because this is the foundation, Wesley said. All of this helps us. Yeah, again, better understand it. And then one last question is just, you know, well then, okay, once I understand that, or at least have an idea, how am I to respond to it? How am I to respond to what God said? You know, James in his letter said, hey, don't just be hearers of God's word, be doers of God's word. You know, don't just read it, but live it, in other words. And so when we read this, so the question is, well, what does God want me to do with this? How does this impact uh, me. And so uh, sometimes, you know, what that means for you will mean something different for me. Uh, where we are in life, what we're dealing with, uh, may, you know, we read something and it, it, we understand it or it, you know, it shapes our response differently. 
Because sometimes I think the scriptures, they move us to repentance, to turning back toward God. Other times, the, uh, it's like we're looking in a mirror and, and when we see ourselves. Uh, and, and, you know, because I, I, I tell you, I, I can see myself wandering in the wilderness with those Israelites, you know, doubting God, trusting in myself more than God. You know, I can see myself when I read about David. You know, here's a man after God's own heart, but here's also someone who fell prey to temptation. You know, I can see myself when I read about the rich young ruler who, who wants to follow Jesus but just can't give up his own riches to do so. You know, I see myself when Jesus says, hey, I spit you out of my mouth because you were lukewarm. And I see myself over and over and over again when I read uh, the Scriptures. But see, that's what the Scriptures do. They confront us, they challenge us, they convict us, they move us to change, hopefully. Sometimes they just give us comfort because that's what we need. Other times, uh, it gives us strength for the next day or builds us up when they remind us that, hey, that we are a son, that we are a daughter of God, that God never leaves us or forsakes us, and that nothing can separate us from, from his love. These scriptures do all these things and more. An unknown writer uh, said this about the Bible, which actually is found in every introduction of a uh, Gideon Bible. So if you go in the hotel room, hotel room, you pull up the drawer, you find that Gideon Bible, you'll find this introduction. But I love it. It says, the book is the mind of God, the state of humanity, the way of salvation, the doom of sinners, the happiness of believers. Its doctrines are holy, its precepts are binding, its histories are true, and its decisions are immutable. Read it to be wise, believe it to be safe, practice it to be holy. It, can, it contains light to direct you, food to support you, and comfort to cheer you. It is the traveler's map, the pilgrim's staff, the pilot's compass, the soldier's sword, sword and the Christian's character. Here paradise is restored, heaven opened, and the gates of hell disclosed. Christ is its grand subject, our good its design, and the glory of God its end. It should fill the memory, rule the heart, and guide the feet. And so read it slowly, frequently, and prayerfully. It is a mine of wealth, a paradise of glory, and a river of pleasure. Follow its precepts, and it will lead you to Calvary, to the empty tomb, to a resurrected life in Christ. Yes, to glory itself for eternity, for this is God's diary. It is the heart and the pulse of God. I like that. I like that. And I think one of the, the, the biggest mistakes that we can make is just to, to take this and say, oh, well, you know, this is a good moral book, and we just kind of approach it in, in, in that way. And we, you know, we read it to find out, well, you know, how, how should I live and, and just, you know, just to, to guide us. As a more, use it as a moral compass. Don't do the bad. Don't be like the bad people here. Be like the good people. But if that's the only, you know, that's the only way we use this book, then I think we're missing out, you know, on the, the central theme. Because, you know, this book is meant to, to, to give us life. You know, you're reminded, you know, Jesus, he's on the, on, on the hillside when he's, when he's out in the wilderness before he begins his ministry you know, and, and the devil comes and tempts him and the devil says, you know, hey, I, I, I know you're hungry. How about turn these stones into bread? What does Jesus say? One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That is how we live. Because God speaks to us through these words. God speaks through songs, yes. Through nature, yes. Through sermons, sometimes maybe. Uh, through those that are around us, yes. But I'll tell you, God primarily speaks to us through God's word. I mean, you can have uh, all the Wonder Bread, a ciabatta, a, a sourdough, French bread, whatever. And you can still be starving to death, folks. You can be starving to death if you haven't read God's word. And so my hope is we read it, we wrestle with it, but we are also shaped by it. Because this is what gives us life. It tells us what life is and how, as Jesus said, we can have life abundantly. Let us pray. Oh God, we are so grateful that you do. You give us your word. You, you, you've given us this story of who you are, you know, who created the cosmos, who chose us to be as people, who sets us free from ourselves, who, who walks with us every step of the way, who takes us back each and every time we, we break your heart. Lord, I give you thanks for that, for these words that remind us of that, that you loved us so much that you gave us your son, who in turn gives us life. So Lord, help us not just to 
have this on our shelf. Or to look to it as simply, oh, it's a good moral book, but Lord, that we wrestle with it, that we read it, that we study it. Yeah, because this is what gives us life, Lord. So help us not just to, to believe in you, but to trust in you and especially to trust in your word and strive to live that out in our lives. And that's not an easy thing to do. We recognize that. Lord, continue to speak to us. Continue to speak to us through your word. For in Christ's name we pray these things. Amen. Before I send you forth, wherever that might be for you uh, this day, let me touch on a, a few things. Hey, if you are in the Charlotte area, uh, please know that today is the first Sunday of the month, and so we'll be hosting our drive-through communion experience uh, from 11 a.m. until 12 p.m. So it's a little bit 
change in the time, but right here on our campus, 6800 Sardis Road here in Charlotte. So if you're in this area, we'd love to see you. We'd love to celebrate the sacraments uh, with you. Also, in your, if, if you're in this area, hey, there's something about some dunk tank this afternoon and Duncan, the senior pastor, because, of, well, just, we're celebrating um, the fact that so many people are now utilizing our, our, our new church community builder um, Kind of software there. So that's happening, I believe, at four o'clock out here in the front. So if you want to come by and participate or just check it out, you can do that. So that's for folks that are here in, uh, you know, obviously in this area. But we recognize not everybody is in, from the Charlotte area. And so again, thanks for being a part of that. And here's whether, wherever you are, here's what you, you can still do. Yeah, you can still pick up your Bible every day and you can read that. You can still, you can connect with us. You can do that virtually. So no matter where you are, out in Kansas or Florida or West Coast, East Coast, uh, you can still connect with us. We have you know, classes that meet virtually, uh, and they, they really dig into the Word. And it's great. That's how we learn. When we, we, I think, and we grow when we are with others who are doing the same thing. And, and I love that we have such a diversity of, of groups here. So if you'd love, to, we'd love to connect you to, to one of those groups. You can reach out to just uh, the Kelly Slayball here on our church staff or just send us a note and we'll get it to her and she'll get you connected. This is God's word. It speaks to us. It speaks into our lives. It speaks into our world. Uh, that's how we know who God is, but also how we know know more about who we are. And so let this word continue to, to be that living word because we read it and we study it and we wrestle with it. So maybe that's what you do. First thing tomorrow morning before you do anything else, maybe you open that Bible and you begin to, to read it. You know, you don't have to read from cover to cover. Pick what speaks to you. Maybe the Psalms is a great place to start or the Gospel of John or the Gospel of Matthew. But somewhere, just, pick up, just begin to read just a little bit of it and see how that speaks to you. Let us go in the name of the one who goes with us always. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.